If our responsibility, which, which it is, is to provide the best insight perspective possible to give the head of our government and our leadership in the national security community, best analysis we can provide to anticipate, warn of, and understand and explain key forces in the world. I'm not defining what I'm doing by the information I'm relying on. Right. I'm defining what I'm doing by that purpose. And increasingly, as especially now as we understand expertise, sharing of information, the experts for transnational issues as well, um, we will be hurting ourselves if we only rely on that information that only we acquire, if you will, and you, that is the classified form of intelligence or the secrets that only we have that others don't have. I'd be challenging ourselves to say, are we truly understanding everything about a given issue if we're only looking and defining what we do, beginning with what comes in on that, if you will, that classified inbox. I'm David Chris, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, September 1st, 2023. The National Intelligence Strategy is out, and with me to discuss it is Michael Collins, the acting head of the National Intelligence Council. We discuss many aspects of U.S. national security, defense, cyber, and intelligence strategy, including the increasing geopolitical significance of non-state entities, and even the meaning of the word intelligence itself. We also cover Mike's long and illustrious career inside the U.S. intelligence community and his thoughts about the future of U.S. intelligence. It's the Lawfare Podcast, September 1st, The National Intelligence Strategy with Mike Collins of the National Intelligence Council. We're going to talk about the new National Intelligence Strategy uh, that was released to the public recently. But before we get to that, let's talk about you. Uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your career, including your current role as the acting head of the NIC, and maybe a little bit about what the NIC, the National Intelligence Council, uh, really is? Well, thank you, David, of course, and thank you so much for this opportunity to exchange some thoughts with you on some of our priorities, and as, of course, they relate to the National Intelligence Strategy. So I'm a career analyst. I joined the agency a long time ago at CIA originally as an analyst of mostly East Asian affairs, served in various capacities as a manager, as an analyst in different AORs, uh, was a chief of staff on the seventh floor for the deputy director, deputy director for our East Asian Pacific Mission Center. I was formerly prior to this job, the chief strategy officer for the CIA, uh, where I learned a lot about and participated in some fantastic uh, conversations about all of our respective government strategies, including the role of the intelligence community. And now I moved over to the National Intelligence Council, um, in a sense, getting me back to the analytic basics uh, that I grew up doing, if you will. The National Intelligence Council within ODNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, is fundamentally responsible for pulling together the coordinated view of the entirety of the U.S. intelligence community on the issues around the world that our policymakers have to wrestle with. We do so both in the short-term capacity, increasingly and in recent years, doing a lot of support representing the entirety of the intelligence community for hard policymaking decisions and meetings that require the view of the IC. But even more so, we're fundamentally responsible for the longer term estimative work of the intelligence community. The National Intelligence Estimate is the signature product produced by the National Intelligence Council, within which we step back and take a look at and examine the broader forces at play on major issues our government wrestle with and how they matter most currently for what policymakers can do today to affect that trajectory, but as well, of course, 10, 15, 20 years out where they may land in the future. We are, if you will, that nexus between the policymaking community and the intelligence community. We don't do policy, we provide objective analysis to support the policy. The national intelligence officers that themselves populate the National Intelligence Council are each senior experts in the regional issues or the functional issues they, they govern. They are also charged with representing the formal analytic position of the USIC, um, of course, across the US government, but as well with foreign and domestic and partners that we engage with. Okay, so I got to I got to unpack a lot of that for our listeners. I think there's a lot of threads to that may be worth pulling. So first of all, you've added yourself as a CIA guy. And so let me ask you, and you're an old, I mean, East Asia hand, um, I'm not going to try to, you know, 
date you or anything, but let me just ask this. When you started back in the day, did you think East Asia, China in particular, would be the thing? I mean, were you that smart that you were looking ahead from, you know, when you joined the agency in 1943 or what? What, what was the thinking, you know, that led you to that? Well, it was a combination of issues. I uh, actually went to my undergraduate work was in political science, international affairs, studying then the Cold War and the end of the Cold War, more specifically, Soviet Union, Eastern European studies. But after the end of the Cold War, as much of a junkie as I was for international affairs and geopolitics in particular, I saw in East Asia where I thought the forces of, if you will, the West and what we stand for and those in other regimes stand for something else. I saw where geopolitics would probably take shape next, if you will. So I also happened to have studied in undergraduate Japanese, not for any strategic reason, if you will, but because I had to meet some sort of requirement instead of taking some other classes. <laughs> and therefore I found myself into the East Asia political military, if you will, arena. I also at that time when I, I started at the agency, I was also pursuing my graduate work at George Washington University. Oh, at the same uh, time. Well, at the same time, and I was doing a, a fellowship um, and then my graduate work where I had started working in the uh, State Department for then Deputy Secretary Strobe Talbot on political military affairs and happened to be in the East Asia arena where I met some people and they sort of encouraged me to look toward uh, the agency. So. so you were at the State Department, not just pretend at the State Department. You were actually working at the State Department. I was going to grad school at the same time. I was at, at a, doing my early graduate work. Um, and doing a policy fellowship then within uh, the State Department, okay. uh, where I got in touch with and met some smart people. Yeah, Strobe Talbot, I mean, you know, deadly gambits and uh, later a big think tank guy. And um, yeah. that's some that's pretty highfalutin company. And that sounds like a pretty intense early experience. And then it sounded like from your review of, of you know, your stuff, which you delivered very modestly, but for people who know each one of those things is like a massive challenge and achievement to survive. Uh, you've you've actually had to be the boss of people and run operations. I don't mean DO, but like, you know, mission centers and chief of staff roles. But now you said, yeah, you're back to your analytic roots. Do you like it better? Are you happy to be, you know, doing the analysis work again, as well as leading a team? But but still, I hope you get to do some analytic work. I do. And what look what I like most about this work now during this period ties to the, you know, the national security strategy and the national intelligence strategy derivative of, in particular, the focus on intelligence itself as a subject of analysis and understanding. And so as an analyst and as a manager of integrated efforts in the intelligence community, I learned and developed a strong appreciation for uh, this pillar of power being stronger when it operates in an integrated manner. Uh, whether you're talking about substantive issues or you're talking about the connection between analysis and operations and support, et cetera. And so now I see from my previous experience, including my last experience as the CSO for CIA, uh, an opportunity to step back and help the community think objectively, not only about the hard issues that we're wrestling with and providing objective analysis to support the policymaker, but are we also reflecting on ourselves? Are we doing better? Are we building our expertise? Can we say things with more confidence? And are we helping to service what the national security strategy itself now asks us to do, which is to prioritize intelligence as a discrete pillar of power? Okay, so I'm going to turn to the strategy in a sec, but there's a little bit more on the NIC before we do that. I mean, you're a CIA guy, but your national intelligence officers, and I'm not going to ask about details uh, on their bios or their numbers or, you know, how you can reach them in, a, in an emergency, but they're drawn from across the IC, right? They represent a different agencies and they're chosen based on whatever. So you've got a kind of a cross-cutting team, which is consistent with your goal of sort of doing meta all source uh, that combines all the inputs from all of the IC's elements that are relevant to a question. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And we have a good variety of experts from across the intelligence community uh, we strive to ensure that we have that mix. Increasingly as well, our, 
and, and historically it has. Our doors are open for smart individuals in the private sector to knock on our door and say, hey, I'd like to take a stab at taking on one of these assignments as well. If we're truly successful, our NIOs know I speak to them as responsible for marshalling the best of the insight that exists across the IC or frankly in the open arena. Okay, so let's say I'm a I'm an international relations professor at you know some fancy pants university. I've never had a security clearance, but I'm a good person and you know haven't done a lot of drugs recently. So can I just apply to like come in and work for you? Would I have I'd have to pass the poly and the background check and everything? I mean, I could be an uh, an intelligence officer. Yes, yes, yeah. That's I mean that's the spirit. We we publicly advertise the openings we have and the various compartments we have. There are, of course, procedures and processes that individuals have to go through to get into uh, the intelligence community. Uh, but, you know, shame on us if we're not openly trying to draw in the best of the expertise, wherever it is. It obviously helps when individuals have a national security experience. But yeah. diversity is really, really important for us across all aspects. So. So college students should take note that those distribution requirements that force you to take Japanese may be very valuable. College professors should note that uh, if you want to make a little extra money on the side, there could be an opportunity working for Michael. So tell us a little bit about your role, the role of the NIC in creating, in devising, thinking about uh, the new national intelligence strategy. What did you guys do on this? You have to begin with the the role we play as well for the larger national security strategy. Okay. So the analysis that we produce, and as you've seen uh, manifested in the director's testimony every year, the annual threat assessment, that kind of analysis greatly informs, of course, what the, um, the senior leadership of our nation decide what they have to focus on, what they need to focus on, and of course, informs the strategies that they put in place for achieving their respective goals. Okay, all right. So there's like a lot of strategies. I yeah. mean, it's a crowded house of strategies, but the big one is the national security strategy from, from which the others flow. Is that fair to say? I mean, that, that's what I hear you saying, but. Correct. That is, so the national security strategy sets the direction, of course, of the, of the White House and national security community on what it is they're trying to most achieve uh, strategically, uh, what the priority issues are that they're wrestling with, that we can get into some of those that you well know. The national intelligence strategy is the direction given to the national intelligence community to prioritize what we need to do to be the best we always can be, both on those immediate issues that we have to wrestle with, but even more so, what are we investing in, focusing on, doubling down on to make sure that over time and space, looking ahead, that we're best positioning the IC for the challenges that we see coming down the pike. Okay, so like the national security strategy, which I think for Biden came out in October of 22, which is, he did like an interim one, I think at the beginning, if I recall correctly, yes. and then was sort of took a little longer to get the uh, formal one done. And um, I might be one of the few people maybe who's a civilian who's actually read all of them. Uh, from at least Reagan forward. They make for fascinating reading, by the way, children. Uh, if you're out there, I mean, apart from being a non-narcotic sleep aid, no, they really are interesting documents and you can see the evolution of the world uh, across these documents. But, but I think you're saying the national intelligence strategy is more of an inward looking. I mean, is it an exhortation from Avril Haines and, and people like her and you to the workforce to sort of explain how we're going to get done what we need to get done and how we need to get better at it? I mean, is, is it really that kind of in, inward facing document? It's a collective, it's a result of collective conversations across the, the leadership of the intelligence community on the issues, the topics that we need to most focus on across all of the intelligence community to ensure, you know, we're, as I say, we're best postured for what our immediate requirements are, but yeah. again, even more so investing in those longer term, as the director laid out in the, you know, the opening of the, of the strategy, the connection between the international and the domestic space and the national security challenges that that creates, the requirement to ensure that our analysis is as deep, rich, and accurate as possible across everything we cover, and the need to ensure that we're using our resources, objectively speaking, and putting them to things that will ensure we're growing across the entirety of the IC. 
there's a collective input that goes into it, but obviously with respect to the director, right? She she puts she in place the directive, you know, she wants. You you see obviously in it a lot of alignment, understandably so, with the national security strategy. But hopefully, you also see in it it's it's different in that it's it's a charge to us, the USIC. It's a public facing document. It's not sure. just for the IC. It's for others like you, uh, you know, for whom we're looking to elicit perspective and collaboration, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was pleased that I, I, I thought it was broadly consistent with the national security strategy and with the national defense strategy and with the national cyber strategy, and even with the fabulous IC data strategy and the worldwide threat briefing, all of these things, they're written differently. They're organized a little differently. They're structured a little differently, right? Some of them are more uh, user friendly. Some of them are more super nerdy, but, th but you can definitely get a feel for what the Biden administration and the intelligence community thinks important. So I, I was glad that like this one was not, you know, one of these things is not like the other and we just have to conclude Avril's gone rogue. But can you just a little bit about the process? I mean, you said it's a collective conversation. Is there some person holding the pen? Is there, is it, a, is it a committee holding the pen? What, what can you tell us, you know, consistent with your sources and methods being protected about how the thing gets done? I mean, ultimately, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence has the pen on the actual final product, if you will, in the strategy. But yeah. it is the result of, you know, extensive and regular uh, conversations with the rest of the community, including as we all individually in our respective agencies put forward our respective budget requirements, the resources we say we need, the activities we say we need support for from across the community. Those early conversations where the heads of the agencies get to communicate what it is their priorities are, those become nested within, if you will, the fabric of this larger strategy that is intended to govern all of it. And obviously, again, with a particular focus on integration across the community, we're better when we operate, as I say, in an integrated manner as only, if you will, in our respective individual yeah. organizations. Is it is it more of a document that is derived from sort of choices that are being made and have been made or articulated elsewhere? Or does it does the document itself in the drafting process sometimes serve a kind of a convening or forcing function to, you know, resolve disagreements or different points of view and so forth? Does it do that second thing or is it's it a combination of both? It's a combination of both where obviously the leadership of the IC gets to and should convey their commander's intent. Right. if you will, on the things that we most need to focus on to be as strong as possible. But at the same, you're listening to and and taking into consideration the, you know, the rest of the indiv individual members to say, well, we this is an area that we have to focus on. And you find in it, oh, there's universality across that right. as it pertains to, you know, say, exam for example, things we need to do to hire the talent we right. need lead or you mentioned the data strategy, uh, efforts being put toward uh, enhanced data that we all could also benefit from. So I'd say it's a combination of the two. Yeah. So some of the value is just in the process itself of, right. uh, of creating a thing. And, and if somebody wants to take a footnote, they can do that subject to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence for many years. <laughs> okay. Well, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the substance of this particular strategy and get into some of the substance. I mean, it, there are six officially stated goals. What, you want to tell us a little bit? I mean, what, what's what should we take away from this document? What's sure. important in it? Sure. So, so there's two things first, I think, that are important to take away from that. One you already mentioned is, of course, the reflection and alignment uh, with, uh, if you will, the larger national security strategy and what the administration is saying more broadly about what our national security priorities are. But you also will see in it, hopefully, as, as we talk about the specific actions, things that are for the intelligence community to do to be better, be stronger. There's clearly a focus on major power strategic competition, uh, obviously, in the world. Obviously, we talk a lot about, as does the national security strategy, um, China in particular, as a major power with ambitions and capability to challenge U.S. leadership and strength in the world. Russia, obviously, our most proximate or immediate manifestation, if you will, of that threat. But it can't be strategic competition alone. It speaks as well to an increasingly eclectic mix of actors, non-state actors, non-state entities, uh, and more complicated international system. And it's buried throughout each of these, 
about how we relate with, partner with, and better understand those non-state uh, actors. A new phenomenon, if you will, not new entirely, check that, but uh, a phenomena for sure increasingly in this system, you know, as we understand it in the world. But third as well is just transnational issues in general, climate change, food insecurity, disease, um, all those issues that from a national security standpoint obviously matter to our nation's security, but are just as critical to what I refer to, this is my term, the global commons, um, and the things on which we need collaborative solutions. They're not, all of these, by the way, are not silos. They're not mutually exclusive. They interact with one another. Now then when you get into the six actions, the thing I would stress is not only do you see in each of them the three things I just mentioned, but in particular you see a an interconnection, a interdependence across each of these. If I'm going to be better at one, I also have to be better at two, three, if you will, and four. So so I totally get the alignment with the national security strategy. And like we talked about, you know, all these strategies should be at least broadly consistent and flowing out of the big one. I want to talk about non-state entities, of course. And I think there's, you know, I do think there's a pretty good case to be made that the world is changing in a way such that non-state entities are exerting a lot more geopolitical impact. Transnational issues, you know, climate change, disease and so forth. I mean, I'm just... I've heard criticism, I don't purport to uh, you know, agree with it, but I just want to sort of pull that out a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about it. There are, or at least I think there are, some critics uh, of particular persuasions that might say, you know, you're watering down the concept of national security if you're talking about global warming. and you're just diluting the core concepts and you know pretty soon you're going to be talking about things like freedom of expression and you know teaching history in the schools a certain way and it's just there's no end to this slippery slope so why are you watering down hardcore concepts of national security like the missile gap and terrorism and mm -hmm. competition with china with stuff like this and you know there's a response to that which is uh, climate change causes drought, which causes famine, which causes migration, which causes transnational geopolitical effects of a more traditional sort. And then there's a different version, which is, look, we just care about people. I mean, look, tell me a little bit about how you think about these transnational issues and their connection to and and sort of being subsumed under the umbrella. Of so, yeah, thanks. Look, I would say two points on this. One, I think they more accurately reflect diagnostically um, a healthy evaluation of our nation's security and what most uh, threatens our nation's security in all forms. And that is our responsibility to ensure we're doing the best we can to protect our nation's security in all forms. And obviously that includes both in the immediate and over the longer term, looking at those global transnational related issues that if we're not solving, somebody will have to solve to ensure we keep our nation secure from those kinds of threats. As I say, the global commons, if you will. Now, yeah. break, those issues are also interchangeably directly related with major power competition. Sometimes you hear, and we can talk about this, these domains for national strategic competition in the world, these same transnational issues that we're studying and trying to be the best we can at trying to help solve uh, the role we can play are also the venues through which we, our nation, are competing with others uh, in the authoritarian world for influence and strategic power in the world. You mentioned norms and standards. I definitely agree. Norms and standards in the world, those transnational issues are increasingly central to the strategic competition we face with major authoritarian rivals who uh, see norms and standards 180 degrees different than the way we see them. So they're not, in one big point, they are not mutually exclusive. One definitely influences the other. Uh, but to the first point you made as well, our responsibility seriously is to our nation's security and those to our partners around the globe. I said on this before, shame on us, but I'll say it again, shame on us if we're not thinking about the role we can play. Additionally, uh, I think we have to think more broadly about the word intelligence itself. Let's go there in a minute. But yeah. so just to round out then on the transnational, this is this is me speaking and you can take it and modify it as you like. But this this isn't, I hear you saying, some 
soft-hearted, woke sort of prelude to the ceding of U.S. sovereignty to the U.N. or some crazy stuff like that. This is a objective, hard-nosed, hardcore look at what actually matters in the world and the way it affects our national security and a recognition of the environment we're actually in. Yes, correct. I mean, clearly, several years ago, people would have been asking the same question, should we worry about pandemics yeah. and disease in the world? Well, look what it did to our nation's security. Yeah. So again, um, that is a great example as to the others you mentioned. I mean, your podcast, Lawfare, Criminal uh, Activity in the World, the Absence of Lawfare, uh, is itself a transnational <laughs> issue that you right. Excellent. And I did not slip How do you like that? bucks to like <laughs> work that in, but I'm very grateful for it nonetheless. Okay. So yeah, I want to pull a couple of threads uh, subject to your tolerance. One is talking about non-state entities and how they are important and differently so than maybe in the past. And the other is in the, in that, what you just said that I was intrigued by, which is what is the meaning of the word intelligence and how has that changed? And maybe those two things are related. So you're the guest. You got a preference to take one of them on uh, uh, first? Yeah, well, let me begin by because I teed it up, this notion of intelligence. And maybe perhaps I'm putting on, maybe it's an academic hat, but I don't see much of a difference between academic scholarship of the world and what a intelligence analyst in the U.S. intelligence community does to study the world in that my job is to best understand the forces that are affecting issues globally and of course how they create threats and or opportunities for u.s national security however i make those conclusions and derive the information use the information that's necessary for it if we challenge ourselves to use the word more literally mm -hmm. intelligence i'm more smart on the international landscape and the forces that matter than i was yesterday or a year ago including in a more competitive sense, I'm more intelligent on the things that matter for strategic influence and power in the world than my rivals are. I tend to emphasize that interpretation because it, then it opens up the gamut of the perspective and the information we depend on, again, including from experts out there who are studying and are super smart in a whole bunch of issues, and we need to be a part of in that, in that conversation. So, I think about it both from as a as a strategist and a, a junkie for geopolitical international affairs. It means what I said it means, including for the sake that it's now a pillar in the national security strategy. So you have to think about it that way. But again, it's also our a, a better way, a better medium through which to have a conversation with the private sector, the non-state experts who themselves we need you know, if you will, to rely on more. They too are working in the intelligence business um, just in a different form. It's not defined by only, if you will, classified information that we may have access to. It's defined more broadly. Would, would the head of the NIC from 10, 20, 30 years ago, what would he or she say to this idea that intelligence is the condition of being smarter and more insightful than you know, your competitors um, and informing good policy. I mean, some of that, I think everybody would always, you know, General Donovan would have said, yep, that's what I'd like. But, but there's a certain agnostic quality as to the source of information that may be implicit in what you're saying. I, can you bring that out? I mean, what are the differences really? What's really new about this? So, if our responsibility, which, which it is, is to provide the best insight perspective possible to give the head of our government and our leadership in the national security community. A the big audience best, of one. Big audience. The best analysis we can provide yeah. to anticipate, warn of, and understand and explain key forces in the world. I'm not defining what I'm doing by the information I'm relying on. Right. I'm defining what I'm doing by that purpose. Okay. And increasingly, as especially now, as we understand expertise, the sharing of information, the experts for transnational issues as well, um, we will be hurting ourselves if we only rely on that information that only we acquire, if you will, and you, that is the classified form of intelligence or the secrets that only we have that others don't have. I'd be challenging ourselves to say, are we truly understanding everything about a given issue? If we're only looking and defining what we do, beginning with what comes in in that, if you will, that classified inbox. 
sort of flip the script, right? I don't determine what analysis I need to write based purely on something I read that's classified. I determine what analysis I need to write based on what my policymakers are most needing and or some observable that I've seen taking place in the international arena that I need to explain. I think that's really, really important to be as, again, as as smart as we need to be on the issues we follow. But as we'll get into it, and as the national intelligence strategy makes clear in various objectives, be it the talent we want, the partnerships we need, the capabilities you know, we need for the IC, the resilience we need for ourselves, as well for those elements of U.S. national power. We've got to be more somehow in the middle of that conversation. And I think a more expansive definition, if you will, of the word intelligence can help perhaps. Kind of get us there. Okay, so if you're focusing on being smart and you're not limiting yourself to particular trade craft that involves super secret, you know, exquisite sources and methods and all the nifty stuff that maybe only you guys can do. I mean, you know, how much has the the world changed? I'm thinking again of this conversation between you and your hypothetical predecessor who in the olden days might have relied on, you know, human intelligence yeah. and massive SIGINT, super duper cool stuff that can't be talked about that only you presumably have, and then might take their draft, you know, national intelligence estimate and send it around to Princeton and see what professor so-and-so has to say sure. on it. You're talking about a different world where if I'm hearing you right, I mean, it, you know, in the olden days, the, the cake was secret stuff and the frosting was a little academic overlay on top of it. And now maybe are you saying, geez, looks like frosting and cake have changed places. We've got open source, commercial data, all this public intelligence out there. And then we're going to layer on top of that a frosting of exquisite stuff that only we have. Is it Has it really flipped to that degree or is it moving towards that? Or is that a stupid analogy? And I, no, I, think, I, think, that's, I think that's a reasonable analogy. I don't know if I would necessarily, I wouldn't want to equate, if you will, <laughs> the balance between the cake and the frosting. Yeah. Um, but let, let me begin by saying, to be sure, today and certainly as we move forward, we are going to, our nation is going to continue to require only uh, what can be uh, obtained through, you know, secretive means to get at the hardest of the hard issues as it pertain to, you know, the intentions and motivations and capabilities of, you know, our hardest of, of challenges and and such no um, substitute for the tea for the microphone in vladimir putin's tea kettle or whatever right <laughs> right purely hypothetical example folks but in addition i think as we've discussed how more interconnected the world is the global economic commercial technological arenas the increasing power and influence of what i call if you will the outer circle the the other issues in the world, the other uh, arenas in the world, not just, if you will, the the rivals, the authoritarian rivals, and of course, the non-state actors who increasingly matter. Um, if we're only looking at and admiring just the inner circle of what the, you know, the, um, the state adversary or challenger is trying to do with what motivations and capabilities, and we're not, if you will, at the outer circle, say, understanding what makes populations in the world tick, um, what are the things that matter most to those countries and audiences that we're competing with influence over, then we're not going to sufficiently, I think, help the policymaker and our nation navigate these issues. It would be imbalanced to just look at one side as opposed, if you will, to the other, if that makes any sense. It, so it makes sense to me, but when I take it seriously, I feel like the floor might be falling out from under me because it is such a quietly stated, modestly presented, radical proposal that I think is saying, hey, this is how I'm hearing it, Mike, you can disagree and whatever, but like it sounds like it's saying, hey, we need to completely rethink the way we do things because, you know, everybody who went to the Fletcher School and, you know, trained in the 1980s and 90s is really used to focusing on, you know, what is the president of X country's plans and intentions and we need to spy on him or her up and down sideways. And what I hear you saying in a very steady way, but I think it has big implications, is wait a minute, 
we got to look way broader than that. We got to look at non-state entities. We got to look at non-traditional factors, these transnational elements. And so we got transnational elements affecting the world in a hard nosed way, not because we're getting soft and woke or whatever, or that we are interested in other things, but because those factors affect us and the non-state entities that are out there affect us too both because they're sources of information or insight or intelligence in the new sense you're talking about, and we cannot ignore them, and because they are geopolitically relevant as actors in the world stage and affect the way things actually come out. And you say it like you've got it figured out and like it, it sounds very compelling, but is it not a fairly radical idea that would require a pretty significant rethink, maybe retool? I may be overstating, but I feel like it's got a lot of oomph behind it. Yeah, I, I, I'm i not alone, I don't think, in this journey. I think others as well, who colleagues of mine uh, across the community, you hear it increasingly to help our nation navigate this complicated, uh, more contested international arena if all we did again was to double down on the the nation we're competing with and in particular the thoughts and motivations and goals of that leadership we are not going to be able to as necessarily objectively frame whether we think they can succeed or what are the factors out there that would determine such success and therein all of our nations are increasingly dependent upon things in the transnational arena and again, a lot of the expertise on these issues are heavily resident within the non-governmental domain experts studying these various issues. So I look at it more as opening up the book even more to ensure that we're thriving in and taking advantage of everything that's being done out there to understand and frankly, even expose the truth. You know, there, the fact that there are private sector entities that can increasingly identify via AI techniques or just really good investigative journalism techniques, find the truth openly, that's fantastic. That yeah. gives us something to work with on which, to use your metaphor, maybe we sprinkle the, you know, the frosting. <laughs> <laughs> what have you, right? Someone's going down, that's yeah. going to be down in infamy. Yeah. So if the New York Times does a really great story on something, you'll you'll happily take it, right? Well, and, and we have obviously, to us, as with anybody who's constantly challenged by the explosion of information that's out there, a good portion of which can be misinformation or disinformation or just simply opinion without substantiated empirical facts. To be true to our tradecraft, of course, we have to find the primary source of whatever that claim was. Raw critical thinking bears in. But if I find something I've read that is well sourced and well researched, again, I keep saying this over and over, but again, shame on me if I'm ignoring that because I didn't produce it or it came from somebody else. Yeah. And that's a common problem in many cultures, right? Not invented here means not good. Right. And you're not alone in, in having that challenge. Um, and then by way of like the role of non-state actors, I'm trying to just give an example that makes it real for our audience. I mean, so you and I have both heard Bill Burns talking a lot about how one of the key, if not the key forum in which competition with China will play out is technology. And I don't think there's anybody who thinks that you know today's cutting edge technology whether it's large language models or you know online advertising and or whatever it is is really being developed in the first instance or controlled by the US government it isn't like the Manhattan project uh, or even like the moon landing frankly where we did kind of have a monopoly now you've got you know god knows how many US and foreign companies trying to you know put rockets up there and you've got, you know, commercial SIGINT and you've got, you know, AI being developed everywhere. And I mean, I'm not going to ask you to comment on Ronan Farrow's recent New Yorker article, but you've got single individuals who can decide whether, you know, war fighters in Ukraine either do or do not have good comms. I mean, that is right. That is just not the world that we remember 
from the 1940s and 50s, right? So like, if you think technology matters, and I think just about everybody right. does, you've got to acknowledge that private sector, non-state entities, sometimes individual humans, have profound influence in a way that I think is different, right? I mean, that's right. just to make it real for people, that's consistent with what you're-, you're Correct. Writing. And when you appreciate it as well, what technology can itself also enable, say from a communication standpoint, the provision of basic services, governance standards in some case, in some case, mercenary militaries, if you will, they make other non-state entities, say social movements and political movements, all the more powerful because now they have a means, an easier means by which to be influential and to accomplish things. Uh, this clearly applies obviously in the cyber domain, but in other domains as well. So it's both a appreciation for, as you say, David, where that innovation and where that technology is being developed and the tremendous influence that comes from that, be it commercial or just somebody wanting to be the best at whatever it is they want to innovate on. That's happening obviously in the private sector, the non-state specific sector. But at the same time, I mean, social media, you know, I remember the days when you used to rely on the newspaper and the nightly news right, to find out what happened in the world. Now, today, anybody can report that. And so social media itself as a non-state entity, these platforms provide a, a vehicle through which others can be influential and can affect things, whether in a foreign state or just internationally as well. So yeah, it's a, has where we started an increasingly complicated international system with an increasingly eclectic array of actors. You got a hell of a job and a hell of a challenge in front of you, Michael Collins. I, I, uh, I mean, I'm a little envious. On the other hand, I'm slightly daunted. Do you think, I mean, you, your vision of this seems really well developed and clear. And as you said, you're not alone. Uh, others, I think, share your insights and vision. But I mean, do you think, I guess, two part question, uh, feel free to dodge either one. One, how, how much retooling, rethinking, reorientation, whether cultural or structural or operational, does the IC need to do to really set itself up to succeed in this world, the world you've described, where intelligence means what you mean, what you say it means, and non-state entities are playing the role they, they play? Mm -hmm. what, what kind of work needs to be done? How, how, how much work? And are they, are they up to it? Are you up to it? I mean, do you think people will pivot, improvise, adapt, overcome, and adjust as needed? How long will it take? What, what's the process going forward so, if you're right? Yes, look, on the last point, definitely so. I, I'm an optimist through and through, but I also know this work is increasingly all the more foundational for our nation's success, and it's why I do the job that I do, um, and I'm passionate about it, and I'm not the only one. The people I work with across the entirety of the USIC are just as passionate about this. What I find is helpful um, in ensuring that we're moving forward as the national intelligence strategy is challenging us to do on those areas that make us better, I think it's helpful, important for us to reflect on whether we in fact are doing so. Every strategy uh, should have at its core, when do I know I'm being effect as successful? Right. You know, on the non-state entity issue. So we talk about in the national intelligence strategy enhanced partnerships for the USIC around the world, but as well with the private sector. If we're successful, um, I would anticipate more non-state experts knocking on our door to want to work with us, collaborate with us, sharing information, and be because of something we're also doing that helps them, right, in, in part. I, I would expect as well that if we're uh, successful, uh, you know, the capabilities that we acquire from the non-state entities obviously will be increasing. And to the point made earlier, because of our role we play in helping the larger government to ensure the resilience of our vital national security institutions, including those in the non-state arena, I would expect our organs of power, if you will, to be more resilient and protected from the threats. You made the point earlier, they are as well of an attack surface, uh, as we appreciate how powerful they are to our nation's security and to the larger geopolitical landscape. I think the same applies as well to on any given strategy, are we getting the talent that we most need? Are we to the one point in the national intelligence strategy on innovative and interoperable uh, solutions? Those are all things we can reflect on and objectively try to evaluate. I think that's really core. 
and gets back to something I said earlier up front, where when we're doing strategic analysis in an objective way, we are at the same time challenging ourselves and reflecting on whether we're doing it better. Well, you have to have, therefore, in the back of your mind, what do I know that success actually looks like? And we're doing that and, frankly, rightfully increasingly being held to account for it. I think that's really important. All right. So we are almost out of time. I'm going to make a plea, but after I'm done, I'm going to ask you whether you have any closing thoughts or stuff that we didn't cover that we should have. But the plea is this. On the talent front, if you are a non-state expert uh, with an understanding or intelligence that could be useful, then, you know, send your cards and letters to Michael Collins at the National Intelligence Council. I've worked with Michael and he is good to work with. Uh, so this is a just unmitigated pitch for all you smarty pants people out there who might not have any connection to the IC, you know, send in your resume um, because there's some really, really interesting stuff that is really important and needs working on. So if you're listening, don't be shy. Okay, so Michael, any closing thoughts for our audience? Anything you wanted to cover that we didn't cover? Um, yeah, look, th thanks, David. I appreciate the call out. Look, what at a broader level, what many of us are advocating, and you saw it as well referenced in the National Intelligence Strategy, the normalization, if you will, of what we do. It's sort of related back to the point I made about intelligence. It is normal for us to want to study international affairs and to be a part of the rest of the the nation and those, frankly, around the world who are also studying the same issues, be they hardcore national geopolitical issues or the transnational issues we discussed, um, we have to find a way to be more normal, if you will, in the way in which we do that. You know, at the same time, we're learning, frankly, from our engagements with the external community about how we make our work life more normal. It'll never be as normal as you sitting in your basement, drinking your coffee every day and <laughs> et cetera, working from home, if I use that example. But we are trying to find ways, of course, to make work in the USIC even more rewarding to be the place where you can grow and innovate and be at the best of your craft. And at the same time, be resilient yourself on the things that make you resilient. Uh, we're being challenged by smart people like yourself and others to say, hey, how, what about this? What about this? What about this? We can find ways to, if you will, meet this community halfway at least. All right. So there's a huge amount of rich content in this podcast, but I think we all know what the bumper sticker is going to be. Be more normal. <laughs> okay. Words to live by. Michael Collins, thank you very much. It's been terrific having you. Um, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you, David. Thank you for the great opportunity. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter at patreon.com backslash lawfare. You'll get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell, and your audio engineer for this episode was Ian Enright of Goat Rodeo. Our music was performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.